welcome everyone to uh, today's quarantine clinic today is day uh, 11 and today we'll be taking motor neuron disease so so far in our uh, new series of uh, clinics we have covered movement disorder and parkinson and we have covered dementia and alzheimer's today we'll be taking uh, motor neuron disease now it is a very uh, specific kind of disorder so the approach to it has to be taken separately that is why i'm uh, putting another clinic entirely just for this because uh, in our previous uh, series we had taken uh, approach to uh, quadriparesis and paraparesis and neuropathy but motor neuron disease lies in the uh, sort of in the boundary area between umn and lmn because it has some features of umn and some features of lmn so uh, when you know that it is a case of motor neuron disease then it is easy to evaluate but when a patient comes to you for the first time it might be a little confusing initially if you are not uh, used to seeing those cases that is why we will take motor neuron disease separately so first the name by the name itself you can tell a lot so in a case of motor neuron disease it is a pure motor illness and the neurons are involved the motor neurons are involved so there are two types of motor neurons there is upper motor neuron and there is lower motor neuron so in a motor neuron disease it's a purely motor illness and both upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron are involved there is another name for motor neuron disease and that is als now you you may have heard this recently there was a viral als challenge which was the ice bucket challenge uh, so that's why als became very popular at that time but what als stands for is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis so what are these terms what is amyotrophic what is lateral what is sclerosis so amyotrophic basically means muscle wasting lateral refers to in the spinal cord it is the lateral part that is affected and this lateral part contains the pyramidal tract so if you remember the pyramidal tract had an anterior part and a lateral part so the anterior part is small and the lateral part is big so initially it was noticed that uh, when a patient died of als and they did the autopsy they found that the lateral part of the spinal cord was damaged and later they found that this was actually because the lateral pyramidal tract was in that area so the lateral part refers to the lateral corticospinal tract and sclerosis means hardening So it becomes like a fiber, like a tough uh, rod-like thing because of gliosis. So that is how this word, the, uh, these words came to be known as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis because it was literally, they described what was seen on clinical and pathological findings. So amyotrophic, the patient came to them with muscle wasting and then after he died and they did a biopsy they found that the lateral uh, spinal cord was involved and uh, this lateral spinal cord was hardened it was gliotic so they called it sclerosis so that is als the person who named this was charcot now i'm not going to go into who was he and all that but i would suggest that everybody just read about him he's an incredible person he had a huge hospital uh, which was um, initially he is responsible for uh, diagnosing and discovering so many diseases and um, he's had an incredible life so just read about charcot if you can there are a lot of diseases named after him charcot's joints charcot's disease which is als <clears throat> so he he discovered uh, als and another 
famous name that you may have heard regarding this disease is it's also called as lou gehrig's disease lou gehrig was i think he was an american baseball player so uh, he was one of the uh, famous personalities to develop this disease and so it was called as lou gehrig's disease so that's about the nomenclature now what is it what is motor neuron disease so in motor neuron disease what happens is your corticospinal tract is involved so your corticospinal tract starts from here in the cortex from these cells known as bets cells so your bets cells start sending down these axons and they combine to form the cortico spinal tract and this tract will come down the brain and it will cross over in the medulla so this is the medullary level and at this level it will cross over from the right side to the left side and then it will come down here as two parts one is the anterior and one is the lateral corticospinothalamic tract okay now the anterior part actually does not cross so if there are two corticospinal tracts from your right and your left and this is the level of your medulla your 80% of the tracts will cross to the other side to form the lateral corticospinal tract of the opposite side whereas the remaining 10 to 20% will continue in the same side as your anterior corticospinal tract okay now this is not important for uh, motor neuron disease but since we are discussing pyramidal tract this is an important anatomical fact to remember about your corticospinal tracts so uh, for all practical purposes we are only going to be discussing the lateral corticospinal thalamic tract because that is the tract that involves your limbs so your lateral spinal thalamic tract is responsible for moving your hands your legs and your anterior corticospinal thalamic tract is responsible for moving your uh, trunk so in this uh, disease it's mainly your limbs that are affected uh, your trunk is already aff also affected but to, we'll mainly be focusing on the limbs part that is a lateral corticospinal thalamic tract now what happens when the tracks come down so the tracks has the tracks have crossed in the medulla and they are coming down and this is the lateral spinal thalamic tract here there is the spinal cord and as you know the tracks are all lying in the white matter so if you remember the spinal cord has a central gray area and a peripheral white matter so central gray matter and a peripheral white matter so the corticospinal thalamic tract lies in the white matter and the lateral one will lie laterally and the anterior one will lie anteriorly so we we are discussing about these two and we are mainly discussing this now this lateral spinal thalamic tract will go like this now what will happen let's take a more zoomed in approach at the at every vertebral level you have a inside the gray matter you have a cell called lower motor neuron and this lower motor neuron is what is responsible for ultimately moving the muscle so the lower motor neuron releases a nerve and this nerve will ultimately move the muscle 
but how does the lower motor neuron know which muscle to move this information is sent from the corticospinal tract so the corticospinal tract which is in the lateral part will enter the gray matter and tell the lower motor neuron to move this muscle okay so that is the function of corticospinal thalamic tract that your brain has to control the muscles so your brain will send the corticospinal thalamic tract from the upper motor neuron now these bets cells are the upper motor neuron so if you want to simplify it there is umn lmn and a muscle between the umn and lmn is the corticospinal thalamic tract and between lmn and muscle is the nerve okay and your motor neuron disease affects this part so it will affect your upper motor neuron that is your bed cells it will affect the corticospinal thalamic tract itself and it will affect the lower motor neuron it will not affect the nerve it will not affect the neuromuscular junction and it will not affect the muscle so all your other lmn areas are spared but your lower motor neuron itself is affected okay now what does this mean for us clinically if you remember your umn versus lmn discussion there are certain features that you get clinically when an lmn lesion is present and there are certain features that you get when an when a umn features are when there is a umn lesion versus an lmn lesion so if the lesion is anywhere here or here or here you will get umn findings and those umn findings are weakness increased tone which in this case will be spasticity and increased reflexes which is hyper reflexia so if there is a pure umn lesion that is the lesion is anywhere above the lower motor neuron you will have some weakness there will be spasticity so if you try to flex the elbow or extend the elbow initially there will be resistance and then there will be a give way sensation which is called as clasp knife spasticity and there will be increased reflexes so your reflexes will be brisk if your reflexes are very brisk there might be a clonus which is a continuous to and fro movement as long as your pressure is exerted so these are your umn findings now there are certain findings that you get if there is an lmn lesion which is weakness which is much more than the umn so plus 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 there is decreased tone that is hypotonia there is decreased or absent reflexes which is a reflexia there is fasciculation and there is atrophy and we spoke about why all of these findings come we spoke about it both in uh, quadriparesis and when we spoke about neuropathy so uh, if you want to revise that you can just check out that video but uh, specific for this discussion i want you to remember why we get atrophy now your if your nerve is spared and your muscle is spared atrophy basically means what that your muscle which is supposed to be this thick will eventually become this thick okay so the thickness of your muscles decrease because there is muscle depth
so why does that happen why does your muscle go from this uh, this to this the reason this happens is because your nerve is no longer carrying nutrition so that means that your neuromuscular junction is no longer getting stimulated and therefore your muscles undergo disuse atrophy and the reason that this is happening is because your lower motor neuron is no longer releasing those signals it's no longer releasing those impulses okay so this happens in all your lower motor neuron or uh, diseases but it will especially happen in an lmn lesion because if the source is only gone then everything ahead will obviously be useless <clears throat> so this is the rough revision of what you get in a umn lesion versus what you get in an lmn lesion now in motor neuron disease you have both umn and lmn so one of the classical findings of motor neuron disease is that in a patient in the same limb so in say this is the left upper limb in the same limb you will find both lmn findings and umn findings and if you get this scenario of both umn findings plus lmn findings in the same limb then the chances are that this is mnd because there are very few other conditions that can come with this presentation now what can what can this presentation be so what does that mean same limb umn plus lmn so what are the umn findings there is weakness but weakness is there in your lmn also so weakness is one of the findings that will be definitely there because it can come from both a umn lesion or an lmn lesion what are the other ones there is increased reflexes and there is spasticity so if you get weakness increased reflexes and spasticity you think that this is a umn but when you examine you find that there is atrophy and there is fasciculation now if you come back to the five things that you find in lmn these five things were weakness fasciculation and atrophy but you also get hypotonia and absent reflexes but these two hypotonia and absent reflexes are overridden by your umn findings because in umn you get increased reflexes and increased tone and in an lmn you may get decreased reflex and decreased tone so your umn will trump over lmn in these two things so you get weakness increased reflex and spasticity because of umn and the remaining two things your atrophy and fasciculation they will be seen okay so this is what umn plus lmn means so in any patient with in the same limb you get brisk reflexes and spasticity and there is muscle wasting and there is fasciculations then that means that it's a patient of motor neuron disease now where all can you look for this combination of umn plus lmn you can look for it in any of the limbs so you can look for it in your upper limbs or your lower limb or you can look for it in the tongue that is the mouth so in a in the tongue a patient may come with spastic speech so when your tongue muscles are all spastic it's not able to move properly so you get spastic speech plus tongue fasciculation so if there is both umn of spastic speech and lmn of fasciculation then this is motor neuron disease and this is such a clear finding that 
there is almost no other differential diagnosis. For all practical purposes, if you get both of these findings in the same limb or in the same area, there is no other differential diagnosis. You can think that this is MND. Okay, so this is why it is, that's why I'm stressing on this so much because it is such an important clinical finding. Now, why am I insisting on the same limb? Because what we are concerned about, what we have to prove basically is that if this is the spinal cord, we want to prove that if this is the LMN and this is the muscle and this is the pyramidal tract that is leading up to it, we want to prove that there are UMN plus LMN findings in that same myotome, which basically means that the same lower motor neuron that is supplying a muscle, that lower motor neuron is affected and that upper motor neuron that is supplying that lower motor neuron, that is affected. That is why I'm specifying the same limb because let us see a hypothetical example of a patient who has upper motor neuron signs in the leg and lower motor neuron signs in the hand. So hand is lower motor neuron and leg is upper motor neuron, which means that the, the, in the leg, if you see there is spasticity and reflexes are increased. And in the hand, you get atrophy and fasciculations. Now, is this motor neuron disease? Because you have LMN plus you have UMN. So does this combination make it motor neuron disease? It can make it motor neuron disease, but there is a very, very important differential diagnosis that you have to think of in this case, which is a cervical cord lesion. Because what will happen in a cervical cord lesion that if this is the cervical cord, sorry, let me just draw it again. If there is a lesion here in the cervical cord, then the nerves that are coming from that area, the element will be involved, but the UMN fibers that are coming from above and supplying the leg, that will also be involved here. So for the leg, for the leg, the element will be spared. So for the leg, it is a UMN lesion because the lesion is high up in the cervical cord, which is why you may get this finding of UMN findings in the leg and element findings in the hand if there is a cervical cord lesion. So it need not be motor neuron disease. And because a cervical cord lesion is treatable, it is very, very, very important to diagnose a treatable cause if you are suspecting motor neuron disease because motor neuron disease is not treatable. That doesn't mean that there is nothing you can do. There are a lot of things you can do to help a motor neuron disease patient, but we still don't have a cure. Whereas if you, if you do discover a cervical cord lesion, suppose there is a tumor or there is some demyelination or there is a cervical spondylosis that is compressing the cord, all of this has treatment options. That is why before diagnosing a case of motor neuron disease, it is very important to rule out other conditions that can present similarly. But if both UMN and LMN were in the same limb, so in the same hand, there is both fasciculation and atrophy and brisk reflexes. Then there are very other few conditions that can come like that. So you are thinking that it could be a motor neuron disease. Okay, 
So that is the clinical picture of motor neuron disease. We've talked about what all can be the presentation. Now, what all can't be the presentation? So we already spoke about how it's a pure motor illness. Very rarely, some percentage of patients can come with vague sensory symptoms, but they will never come with clear cut sensory loss. So they will never come as a neuropathy where the distribution of one nerve, there is sensory loss or there is sensory loss in half your body. So they will never, never come with a clear cut sensory loss pattern, but they may complain of paresthesia, tingling. So vague sensory complaints can be there. Your bladder is usually not involved. So if your bladder is involved, you have to think of a cord lesion. But some patients may come with urgency. So basically what I'm trying to say is if there is a patient who comes with pure motor symptoms, but they have parastasias and they have some urgency of passing urine, that does not completely rule out motor neuron disease. It can still be motor neuron disease. But if there is a clear cut sensory loss or if there is a clear cut bladder involvement in the form of retention, for example, then you need to look for other causes uh, with greater urgency. Uh, all right. One more clinical finding that I want to talk about in motor neuron disease is your cortical function. Now, so far, everything that we spoke about was to do with either your speech or your limb involvement. But sometimes motor neuron disease can present with problems in the brain. And this is because just like your corticospinal tract is involved, just like your lower motor neurons are involved, similarly, your upper motor neurons are involved which are cells in the brain which are cells in the cortex and if there are sufficient number of cells involved and you know that in the brain no neural network is only dedicated for one thing all the networks also do some other functions so if there are a lot of cells a lot of damage in the brain it can present with something known as pseudo Bulbar palsy. Now, what is pseudo bulbar palsy? Clinically, they present with emotional disturbances. So, there is excessive laughing, there is excessive crying. Okay, so they may have behavior changes. So, they may get irritated, they may get too sad, they may get too happy they may suddenly start crying or suddenly start laughing. So these are all, it's sort of like an emotional instability, which is a part of pseudobulbar palsy. And um, one last thing that I wanted to talk about is, yesterday when we were discussing dementia, I, I spoke about how in your degenerative dementia, so in the dementias where your brain starts decaying by itself, the commonest cause is Alzheimer's, but I also mentioned something called FTD. If you remember, FTD stands for frontotemporal dementia. And this is very uh, nicely named because frontotemporal dementia basically involves your frontal lobe and it involves your temporal lobe. So these two areas are involved in your frontotemporal dementia. And so all the findings that you get in frontotemporal dementia are obviously something to do with your frontal lobe or your temporal lobe. So you will, if you remember from yesterday's clinic, the different types of memory, your frontal lobe will have executive dysfunction and your personality changes because your frontal lobe decides your personality and social skills and uh, your temporal lobe will have your short-term and long-term memory so basically ftd presents with all this why am i telling you this because it has been found that there is a spectrum 
where FTD is here and MND is here. And they found that a lot of specific genetic defects can come with either MND or FTD or somewhere in the middle. So like a combination of MND and FTD. So there is a subsection of patients who will come with features of either MND or FTD or both. So they will either present with MND and move to FTD or they will present with FTD and move to MND or they may come with both of this. Okay. So this is just something to remember. So what all are the specialities in which an MND patient can present to? So we are discussing neurology, but an MND patient will not come to a neurologist directly because there are all these different areas in which an MND patient can get affected. So an MND patient may first go to an ENT specialist because they have difficulty in speaking and they have difficulty in swallowing because of bulbar problems. They may go to a psychiatrist because of pseudobulbar palsy. They may go to an orthopedician first because it, they may initially present with joint pains. So all your muscle weakness, all your motor complaints can initially present with just pain. So they may go to an orthopedician or they may go to a neurologist or a general physician. So these are all the places where uh, a motor neuron disease patient may go to. So it's important that they all have an idea of what this is and therefore they can then refer them to a neurologist. Now, one more thing I wanted to discuss was patterns of presentation. Now, initially, while ultimately the patient may look like this, the, ultimately a patient may come with both cortical weakness, uh, cortical involvement with pseudobulbar palsy, uh, bulbar involvement, and all four limb weakness. Initially, they may not come like that. So because it can start off anywhere, there are different forms of presentation. So what if somebody comes with only one arm weakness? So this is known as monomelic MND. So this is when there is only one limb weakness. So that is monomelic MND. And if that weakness is only in the hand, so it's not even in the upper, upper arm, it's only in the hand, this is something that is known as Hirayama. And a lot of times, a Hirayama patient will not progress to involve the rest of the body. So a Hirayama patient is usually a younger patient. It's usually a male patient around 20 to 30 and they will only present with weakness of the hand. So uh, the problem is believed to be somewhere from C7 to T1 spinal cord. Okay. Now that is one presentation. The other presentations can be if there is involvement of both arms. Now, even in your normal MND cases, it usually presents from your upper limbs and then it goes to your lower limbs. But if it continues being only an upper limb problem, this will lead to something like a bimelic MND. That means that both your arms are weak, but your legs are fine. And what happens is that in these patients, they are unable to lift their arms. So because they're unable to lift their arms, both their arms just dangle like this. And this is what is known as man in barrel. So this is from that uh, visual image of a man 
who is put inside a barrel and so he is unable to move both his arms but he is able to walk so imagine that a man has been put inside a barrel but his legs are free so he is unable to move his arms this is that visual image of man in barrel and uh, the third kind of presentation is a pure bulbar onset so his arms and legs are fine but he is unable to walk unable to uh, speak and unable to swallow so that is only your brain stem is involved and a fourth rare kind of presentation is only your respiratory involvement so only your breathing muscles are involved this is rare it's only 1 to 2% but this can also come so if a person comes with only breathing difficulty rarely it could be motor neuron disease now coming to pathology why is this happening so first is the what is the uh, where is the lesion where is there is both umn plus lmn therefore what is the lesion uh, it is a motor neuron disease and then why is the lesion there is degeneration of corticospinal tract now this is this sounds like a very obvious thing but unfortunately that is all we know somewhere in the corticospinal tract from your bed cells all the way down to your lower motor neuron this area there is a degeneration and there are multiple theories as to why there is degeneration one of which is that there is free radical damage the other is that there is there is something called as glutamine in the body and if there is excess glutamine then that is toxic so there is glutamine toxicity another theory is that the the cells in the corticospinal tract in the cells there are mitochondria which is the powerhouse of the cell and there if there is mitochondrial dysfunction if the mitochondria is not working properly for whatever reason then the cells die so uh this is another reason so basically and there is something called as superoxide dismutase this is an enzyme and if this there is a mutation in superoxide dismutase dismutase then that will lead to increased uh, free radical damage so these are all different theories as to why your corticospinal tract can get degenerated but we still don't know for sure why this is and um, we have tried treatment of all of this so we have tried decreasing free radicals by giving antioxidants we have tried giving anti glutamine drugs we have tried uh, solving mitochondrial dysfunction we have tried to solve the superoxide dismutase mutation but nothing has helped so far <clears throat> another theory was that there is increased inflammation so there is increased cytokines but unfortunately your like your other autoimmune diseases where there is increased inflammation but in those cases giving steroids or immunosuppression helps but in mnd steroids also does not help so there is no cure that has been found till now because we still don't know exactly why this is happening uh, so all that we have to offer for these patients is palliation and in general palliation is dismissed as a uh, as a last resort thing that something that if there is nothing else to do just send them to palliative care but it is time that we now started changing our perspective as to what is palliative care because uh, palliative care whether or not something has a cure palliative care is extremely important in all disorders so whether it's a stroke whether it is parkinson alzheimers motor neuron or any other non neurological if there is a cardiomyopathy heart attack in every disease there is a therapeutic aspect and there is a palliative aspect and palliative aspect has to be taken care of separately so the basic concept of palliation is that you make the patient comfortable and this is something that our textbooks and our uh, usual ward rounds we don't talk about it much but 
a motor neuron disease case is a good starting point to start thinking about how do we make the patient more comfortable and this could mean anything which is why palliative care is a very or um, it's not a very clear cut 10 things to do kind of a, a science it is very much about what the patient needs so first thing to do is to talk to the patient and one of the hardest thing to do in motor neuron disease is to how do we break the news because you can imagine that this is one of the most difficult diseases to break the news about because the the patients will not be very very old they'll be somewhere around 50 60 65 uh although there are 75 80 years old patients who do come with motor neuron disease but the younger the patient the more difficult it is to break the news and you are basically telling them that they will have a continuously progressive disease that will make them weak that will make all their muscles get atrophied and they will soon not be able to walk or talk or eat now this is a very very difficult disease to break the news and so it has to be done uh, gently it has to be done sensibly and it has to be done with knowledge so there are a lot of articles i there are a lot of articles in i think lancet neurology has uh, done an entire series of how to break bad news in motor neuron disease uh, I, i'll see if i can share that article with all of you uh, because that is something that you should read because it is something that you can transfer to any other disease how to break bad news is something you should know now when you are breaking bad news what expectation will you give to the patient so for that you need to know how this disease will progress so in time so this is years and this is one year five years 10 years in time one in five patients will survive till 5 years okay and one in 10 patients will survive till 10 years majority of deaths happen in the first 3 years so that is how bad this disease is and this is from the time of diagnosis so majority of the cases will die in the first 3 years and 1 in 5 will reach 5 years and 1 in 10 will reach 10 years now this is approximately and this is why it is so difficult to break this news <coughs> the reason for death is usually aspiration so because they have trouble swallowing they will end up swallowing their saliva and that goes into the lungs and they get infection which is basically pneumonia and that is the commonest cause of death <clears throat> what are the treatment options we still give them all these uh, trials so you do give them antioxidants you do try to make sure that there is no mitochondrial dysfunction you do try to make sure that they are not uh, engaged in any activity that increases their inflammation increases their cytokines so you reduce stress you treat migraine you make sure that their diet and their nutrition is good when they are when they have difficulty in eating you need to give them rice tube feeding and eventually peg peg is so there is a percutaneous gastrostomy so you directly give them food into their stomach you make sure that their physiotherapy is going on as much as they can because that will keep the muscles going on for longer and nutrition and you as much as possible you try to make sure that their earlier lifestyle is continuing so just because they have an illness doesn't mean that they should stop everything whatever they are interested in doing whatever they can do they should continue doing because uh, their mental state is very very important to uh, maintain uh stephen hawking is a very good example of uh of course the kind of resources that he had most people will not have but 
even after getting diagnosed with motor neuron disease for a long time he remained functional and he was still able to do everything that he wanted to um, because you know he was able to communicate and he was still able to work so yeah i think that's about it that was uh, motor neuron disease if there are any questions you can ask me and uh, tomorrow we will take a case of hemiparesis so bhavesh will be presenting anything yeah, else sir can you can you explain yeah. uh, that uh, i missed out on that bladder uh, part in this lecture uh acha the bladder part is basically that your motor neuron disease will not affect your bladder because uh, there is a motor neuron that is responsible for controlling your bladder function which is called uh, onaf's nucleus but this is paired in als okay so your um, yes, uh, while the patient may come with both lower leg spasticity suppose the patient comes with retention of urine which means that he is unable to pass which means that for some reason uh, that control of your bladder is gone that means that the onus nucleus is affected in some way but in motor neuron disease this is not affected so if there is retention of urine you should think of a cord lesion could be like a myelitis or something but you still get urgency in some some cases so radhika just asked if uh, pls is different from als so uh, it is pls stands for primary lateral sclerosis okay and uh, pls is basically a umn lesion okay so uh, in pls you don't get lmn findings you don't get um your wasting and you don't get your fasciculations and um, in als you get both umn plus lmn so that's the main difference also there is some difference in the age group uh, so like pls it presents much later but initially it was considered as part of the spectrum so initially the spectrum was pure umn umn plus lmn and pure lmn so um, there is there are you may have heard something called as sma which is uh, spino spinal muscular atrophy now that is a pure lmn lesion so there you don't get any umn findings and in uh, pls there is only umn so you don't get any lmn findings and in als you get both so that's a sort of like a spectrum all right so then uh, tomorrow 6 o'clock we'll uh, meet again and we'll discuss a case okay chalo bye take care